Pitfall Yun, Counterpoint Value Fund Manager. Compliments of the season. Thank you, Justin. Same to you and, and all your viewers and listeners. Pit, the funds you manage had a phenomenal 2021. You've actually had a phenomenal five years with the Counterpoint Value Fund being the best performing local fund over this period. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. Arguably with the market against your investment style, how did you manage to outperform? Well, there, there were basically two periods, uh, and bearing in mind, uh, you know, I'm, I manage this along with a bunch of my colleagues, uh, so, you know, every, all the kudos shouldn't go st just to me. We are a firm with a number of investment professionals, so Ray Shapiro has been helping me on the fund in the past, and when he was still here, Sam Huli also uh, helped manage the fund. Uh, and so going into, there were two, two things that helped the performance of the fund. Uh, the first thing was going into the coronavirus sell-off in early 2020. The fund was quite uh, defensively positioned in gold and tobacco stocks and those sort of things, which helped a lot uh, in terms of relative performance at the time. And then in about August of 2020, um, we started moving on a big scale into SA Inc., South African businesses, or out of offshore businesses into South African businesses, out of the golds, out of the tobaccos, out of the, um, the more offshore focused businesses and into South African, what we call SA Inc, South African businesses. And specifically, uh, we made a fairly large move into small cap, small uh, South African companies. Uh, and that move really um, uh, paid off very well during 2021 when those stocks performed fantastically well. Pete, bringing it back to March 2020, the coronavirus sell-off, You've managed money for a long period of time. Do you think we'll ever see opportunities like that again? Yes. Yeah, we will. I mean, these sort of sell-offs happen from time to time. Um, you can never predict them. Um, but when stocks get very expensive, um, at some point in time, those sort of things happen. And those are not things to be scared of and to be afraid of. Those are opportunities that present themselves um, for you to make uh, good choices in. And that's the thing you need to bear in mind when these sellers happen it's not the end of the world it's an opportunity um, to pick up good assets at cheap prices Pete, without focusing on the past too much which we have on the past two questions is it time for investors to start tempering their return expectations for 2022 or are you a little bit more optimistic look i'm, I'm still optimistic on the returns available from emerging markets in general non-Asia-based emerging markets, the more the resource-based uh, emerging markets like Russia, Southern American emerging, Latin American emerging markets, South Africa specifically. Um, I'm, I, I think the returns from these markets are still set fair. Um, and it's actually quite simple. What sets the bar for longer term returns for markets are interest rates. So if you look at the interest rates in Russia, in Mexico, in South Africa, in Brazil, they're all between 8 and 12%. Uh, so that's sort of what you're working with. And equity should give you something in excess of that over time. Um, so, so I think the, the, those markets are well positioned. Where I would want to temper my... Um, my expectations around returns is more in the developed markets in Europe and the USA where bond yields are negative or zero because um, that sets the bar quite low uh, and as a result of very low interest rates in those markets I think equities have been priced quite highly because at the end of the day the cash flows to the equity owners of the business are you know the, the present value of cash flows are determined by discounting all the future profits by the interest rate. And if the interest rate is very low, that present value sum is a big number. And that's what's happened to those equities. So I don't think there's room for them to, to for one, to expect fantastic outsized returns from those markets over the next three to five years. The delisting trend is continuing unabated on the JSE. This trend isn't unique to South Africa alone, but the pace of delistings on the local bus is. Why is this the case? So I think there's a number of factors at work here. Number one, from a regulatory point of view, regulatory compliance, accounting, it has become very onerous to be listed anywhere in the world. Um, not only South Africa, anywhere in the world, the rules and regulations have become very onerous. The accounting standards have become 
onerous and almost ridiculous uh, if, if you look at what accounting standards make you do these days, fair value accounting, all those sort of things. So, so that's the one set of pressures listed companies face. So you are seeing um, globally more and more delistings. Uh, the second factor, a very important factor, is that all the money, or at the margin, a lot of the money is flowing into index funds, and all those index funds do is they buy the large companies. So smaller companies get completely neglected. So if you run a small company and you list it, you get no traction anywhere because the, the index funds are just not interested in buying small companies. And also in the asset management industry, up to fairly recently, money has been flowing to the large fund managers, not only South Africa, but globally. And again, they, not, they don't care about small companies. So at the margin, and prices are always made at the margin, smaller companies are getting no love from the market, either from index funds or from the large index oriented fund managers. So the share prices are low. Uh, and so the third thing that is happening right now is that um, entrepreneurs are seeing the opportunity to buy out good small businesses which are neglected by the market at quite low prices and take them in private. Uh, and that is happening on a large scale in South Africa and it's happening in other countries as well. But let me simplify the question. You're a fund manager, but you're also an entrepreneur. You've listed businesses yourself before. Would you do it again if the opportunity arose? What are the benefits with being listed? Um, none at this point in time. No. So the answer in short is no, I wouldn't do it again. I would, I would, uh, it's far better to operate in the private environment. Number one, you can do transactions are much easier to do. Because remember, if you're a listed company and you are dealing with uh, a private other private business and you want to do a merger or a buyout or whatever, that other company, the private company looks at your stock market value and says, but hang on, you know, you guys are so cheap. We, you know, we're not interested or we, the relative valuation is out of whack because you listed and your share price is low. Uh, and they, in the private market, they put whatever, you know, value on their business they want. And they, it's just out of whack. So you can't do deals with private companies because your valuation is so low in the stock market. Um, for a smaller company, there is no benefit to be listed at this point. There's no liquidity because the large funds and indices don't want to look at you. Um, uh, and you can't do transactions. And the regulatory environment is onerous. And the compliance environment is onerous. And the accounting environment is onerous. So there is no attraction at all for a smaller company to be listed at this point in time. Bigger companies, if you're in the index and you can... Uh, and, and you can uh, obtain a high valuation because the index funds are chasing your stock, yes, then you can use your stock um, as a means to do transactions, um, uh, and there, there are adva advantages to that if you're a big company. But for small companies, no, there's no advantage at all. Uh, and the private market is a much better place to be. As you said, in the small to medium cap space, JSC listed counters are being wiped out by foreign buyers, indicative of the cheap assets in South Africa. In order not, to uh, sorry, if I can, they're not being wiped out. I, I think they are being uh, they're being uh, they're being uh, accumulated and being bought up by foreign investors and uh, local private equity investors because the valuations are so attractive. They're, they're, it, they're being uh, uh, you know they're being bundled up is a better term to use. And in order for these assets to leave the JSC, the foreign buyers have to offer shareholders a premium yeah. to the pre-offer yeah. share prices. Do you have a special situations basket in your portfolio in which you identify businesses that may or may not be ripe for a takeover? Look, it's, it's very hard to make predictions or, or to forecast takeover uh, bids on companies. Uh, but the way I look at the portfolios I manage is uh, it's like a bundle of twigs. Um, so you have a whole bunch of cheap situations. Each one individually is cheap and it's probably cheap for a reason. Uh, and it could do very poorly or it could do very well if there's a bid or a buyout offer or if the fortunes of the company turns around or whatever. Uh, so each one of those individually is like a twig. It can break quite easily. But if you bundle those little twigs, those little situations together, you get quite a strong portfolio, which is what I believe the counterpoint value fund to be. Um, so without making any forecasts about potential bids or offers for a company, uh, I just buy them when they're super cheap. And, and the companies only tend to get super cheap when there's bad news around. Uh, so you can't put all your money into one and hope somebody buys it out from your premium because you just don't know whether that's going to happen or not. Pete, you must be getting super excited. All the economic indicators are flashing red, inflation, interest rate hikes, etc. 
is this the Goldilocks era that we've been waiting for value stocks ahead of us? It feels that way, but then again, if you'd asked me, and you did ask me over the past year or two whether I felt that way, and the answer would have also been yes. Um, so there's been a lot of false starts, stop starts, um, but it does feel like there's a sea change happening in the market. I think broadly speaking, uh, global macro is very supportive of the value environment. Um, so I'd be surprised if in three or five years' time we look back and value hasn't outperformed uh, quite strongly. Steinhoff has become a really interesting story. Lots of corporate actions happening amongst the investi companies. Mattress firm selling off a portion of Pepco, the Pepco IPO, with Steinhoff reducing its equity for cash. There's also more transparency with the 24 billion rand settlement. What's your take on Steinhoff's value at the moment? Look, um, I can't get to 560. Um, not on the information I have at hand. I, I've looked at it closely. I, I think there's a lot of... There's, it's almost like a relief rally that, um, that things are clearing up and um, things are coming to a level of certainty because the market hates uncertainty. Uh, so there's a relief rally happening in the shares, but it's very hard for me with information available to get to 560 for the equity of that business. It's, uh, that's a big number. And what's your experience with these companies that are embroiled in corporate fraud and legacy issues? It seems like more often than not, thinking Tongart, EOH, and even Steinhoff, that these legacy-stricken businesses fail to come back to life whatsoever. Once investors lose trust, they run for the hills. Yeah, they do. They run for the hills and, um, you know, they become neglected and out of favor. Uh, and I think especially something like Steinhoff, which is so popular and a big portion of most investors' portfolios, uh, that will be hard for it to get um, its old rating back again. It will, it's possible, but it will take a long time. Um, and there will be many starts, again, many starts and stops along the way. And, you know, we've seen it as low as below one rand, which was quite cheap. Um, and now at 560, uh, five times that value, um, I don't think it's that cheap anymore. Um, but it owns some good businesses. So ultimately... If the management team uh, play the ball well, I think they can, you know, have a very nice business going there um, and do fairly well for shareholders um, over the long term. I think it's quite possible. And the same goes for the others as well. Uh, but what you do need is you need the old management to be cleared out. You need uh, a new thought process in the business. You need ethical business dealings. Um, and you need um, the right people in the, at the helm. Uh, and if, once those things fall into place, then you need time. And so all these businesses can get there if all those things fall into place. Lastly, Pitt, what's the biggest risk to your portfolio in 2022? Sure. Um, the biggest risk to, to my portfolio, I would probably say, is that I get overexcited or too scared of anything and try and fiddle with it too much. Um, the hardest thing to do when you manage money is to leave it alone. So I, I think that's the biggest risk if, if one starts getting too active in your portfolio. I'd, I'd rather just you know, sit on my hands and that's a hard thing to do. So yeah, I would, I'd, I'd probably say that's the biggest risk that I don't sit on my hands.